In this session, I wanted to talk about our denomination, the ELCA. And just like I say about any particular church, this is true also of a denomination, that we are not a perfect denomination. We are not the end all by any means. I often think of the Groucho Marx saying, I would never belong to any club that would have me as a member. And I also say to others, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. So the ELCA, as I promote its great ministry today, does not come without its own flaws. We are certainly not a perfect church, but I happen to like a lot of things about the ELCA. First of all, those of you unfamiliar with that lingo, the ELCA stands for the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America is not that old, relatively speaking. It was formed in 1988 by a merger of three different Lutheran denominations. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. It's kind of alphabet soup, I realize, but sometimes when people talk about being a member of a church or their grandparents and stuff like that, they wonder if it's ELCA and it's all about uh, heritage and lineage of how these came to be. The ALC was one of the streams that formed the ELCA, and it stood for the American Lutheran Church, and it was made up of other churches that formed it in 1960, including the American Lutheran Church, the United Evangelical Lutheran Church, the ELC, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and Lutheran Free Church became a part of it uh, a few years after it was formed. So you have all those streams going into that river. It had, a, at the time of the merger, about 2.25 million members, and its heritage from an immigration standpoint would be linked back to a lot of Germans, Norwegians, um, a lot of people from Denmark as well. and. If we look at that scale, it may have been the more uh, theologically conservative of the forming bodies. Some congregations in the ALC opted not to become of the merger, and uh, the, so they did their own thing, calling themselves the AALC. The headquarters for the American Lutheran Church was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It had its own publishing company, Augsburg Publishing, it was called. And it also was connected chiefly to a fraternal insurance company called Lutheran Brotherhood, or LB. And you sometimes in church libraries and so forth, you may see materials printed by them. The other major river that formed the ELCA was also made up of a number of streams from its history of a merger in 1962, including the United Church, Lutheran Church in America, um, uh, to Dan Danish American Lutheran denomination and also Augustana, which was a lot of Swedish Americans. They all then became the Lutheran Church in America, the LCA. The LCA had its headquarters in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It had its own publishing house too called Fortress Press. And it brought 2.85 million members uh, into the ELCA. There was a third stream, a smaller uh, denomination that came into the ELCA called the AELC, the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches. This uh, has an interesting background in, in that it was a shoot off of the Missouri Synod Church, Lutheran Church, of which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But I, in 1974, there was a fracture at a seminary in Missouri called Concordia in which the student body walked out because of some things that were coming down from administration. There's a whole story to that that I'm not going to go into. There's even a, a movie that's been made about it. But what came out of that was the, the professors and students who left that seminary formed Seminex, which basically was seminary in exile. And they later then, uh, years later, became part of the ELCA, bringing about 100,000 members with them as well. 
So you basically have these three major groups, uh, A A AELC, LCA, and uh, ALC coming together in 1988 to form the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It then decided to have a new town for a headquarters because they tried not to side with one side over another, which sometimes made for some interesting negotiations as in any type of corporate merger. So the headquarters was not in Minneapolis or Philadelphia, but rather Chicago, Illinois, where it remains today. It has a uh, company that comes out of it that helps with benefits for Lutheran leaders called Portico. And then AAL, which is Aid Association for Lutherans that was mainly um, LCA and Lutheran Brotherhood that I mentioned with ALC, they merged uh, as well, though they were not exclusively identified with a particular um, denomination, though they just had a, a majority of their members from that. They all merged to become Thrivent a number of years ago, and we often see that word around our church. They continue to be an insurance company and also uh, give a lot of uh, contributions and support to Lutheran congregations and now even Christian congregations as they have opened their doors even wider. And you can see Thrivent uh, around, uh, especially here in Northeast Ohio. We have representatives uh, that serve as part of that agency and ministry. There are certainly other Lutheran churches, some of which you may be familiar with, some maybe perhaps is not. Up on the screen now is a number of those. The biggest one, aside from the ELCA, which is the largest, is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, followed by the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Now, sometimes when people hear uh, Missouri Synod, they think, oh, that means Lutherans in Missouri. No, that's not correct. It's its own denomination. It's just sort of sprung from there and has continued to continue to keep the na state name in it as well as the Wisconsin one, but really it's they're all across the United States and have um, no particular identity with that state other than the beginnings of it. There are um, other denominations called the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, the North American Lutheran Church, was a, which was a break off from the ELCA a number of years ago, and some other ones that have continued to exist around AALC and CLC um, all for different reasons of uh, leaving or being mad about something or forming their own direction. But the ELCA continues to be the largest of uh, these denominations. We have just uh, around four, almost four million baptized members of our churches. We are the largest Lutheran church in the United States as an ELCA church. There are just under now 10,000 congregations that are divided into 65 synods uh, across the United States, which come under an umbrella of nine regions of uh, our country. We have uh, perhaps like 16, 17,000 leaders now uh, across our country that help form and shape and lead our denomination. We have seven seminaries. There are 20 some colleges, other types of agencies, including high schools, elementary schools, childhood programs, camps, retreat centers that all belong to the ELCA. The ELCA, as I said, is the largest one, almost doubling the second largest one, which is the Wisconsin Synod. This is a slide that sort of shows the different comparatively size where the ELCA fits in uh, of Protestant churches. Roman Catholics have about 68.5 million, Southern Baptist 16.2, and you get down to uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church, which has uh, just below uh, 3 million members, making it uh, larger than most of the ones uh, that we are familiar with. As I mentioned, we do have a number of colleges, universities scattered around the country in different locations, some of them obviously bigger than others, some of them uh, more independent than others, but yet have some connection to the ELCA as a whole. I'm not gonna name all these different colleges, but put on a screen a listing of them. 
I put out, uh, point out Capital University, which is in our state in Columbus, Ohio, of which I am an alma mater, so not trying to play favorites, but I do mention that one. Uh, Teal College, which is a nearby Pennsylvania. We've had a number of members here at CRLC uh, go to Teal College, and it's also near Pittsburgh. Uh, having grown up there, it was the closest Lutheran college to me, but uh, I have never even set foot on its uh, campus, and I need to do that sometime. And then uh, the other Lutheran college in the state of Ohio, Wittenberg University, of which we have a number of uh, graduates in our congregation as well, Capital and Wittenberg. I'm guessing we may skew a little bit more toward Wittenberg in our particular congregation, but I do not know that for a fact, but we certainly have both. And that is located in Springfield, Ohio. And there's a good and fun rivalry between Capital and Wittenberg. We have seven seminaries in the ELCA, also across the country. The nearest one to us is also in Columbus, Ohio, now actually a part of Capital University. They decided a few years ago to um, sort of merge, but basically um, Capital University acquired the seminary, and so it is now a graduate school of Capital University. And going back to its uh, origin back in the 1800s, it actually, Capital University started off as a seminary. And for years, uh, it was a part of the university and then uh, eventually went off to be its own institution only to return here just a couple of years ago. This is the emblem of our church. Our motto is God's work, our hands, four words that really suit to summarize what it is we are about. This colored globe with the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America circled around it is the symbol. If you're on vacation or traveling somewhere and you're wanting to worship and you want to know if a church is uh, ELCA, uh, that would be the symbol that you look for. It's interesting in its beginnings that initially had a red uh, flame around it, thinking about the Holy Spirit for evangelical word uh, around the cross, but the trouble was that it looked a lot like the Methodist church's symbol, of which they weren't real thrilled about, to put mildly, that the two could be easily confused. And so the ELCA uh, fairly quickly came up with a new model as it became a new church. Unfortunately, not a time enough for a lot of people or a lot of congregations who went out and bought all the new signs with the ELCA only to find out that the emblem they had on the signs was wrong, and so they had to buy new ones. And quite humorously, when I'm traveling, once in a while, I'll come across those old signs and see that old emblem uh, that came out in 88 and 89 for churches that have stubbornly refused to take it down and put up the new one. So there you have it. Lutherans at uh, our stubbornness best, I guess. Uh, we are divided into different um, districts, sections of the country, if you will. We are in nine regions. Uh, that was a level of governance that was going to be more prominent in its beginnings, but really has a very minor role in terms of region anymore that you're in. We basically are divided by synods, 65 synods. And those lines are roughly drawn to match so that they are sort of comparatively equal in the number of congregations. But of course, as our population around the United States is not equal by state either, there are some very large geographical synods and some very small synods that have a lot of congregations. But it was an attempt to kind of equalize all that and group them together. Each of our synods has a bishop. And then the ELCA, our denomination as a whole, has a presiding bishop, sort of the pope of our church, if you will. This map shows the uh, regions of the country, the nine regions of which you will see that Ohio, all of Ohio, along with Michigan, Indiana, and Kentucky, make up region six. And then, of course, each region is further divided into synods, and this one shows just how big those synods can sometimes be. As far as the Pope of our church, the presiding bishop, we have had four in our history. The first bishop was Herbert Chilstrom, who just recently passed away. The second was H. George Anderson, who finished his term in October of 2001. 
The third bishop of our church finished uh, his term in 2013, and I feel um, honored that I got to meet uh, all three of them, as well as our current presiding bishop of the ELCA, Bishop Elizabeth Eaton. And for those of you who are new to our congregation, um, just to tell you a little bit of kind of fun history with us, that Bishop Eaton was the bishop of the Northeastern Ohio Synod at the time that she became the bishop of the entire denomination. And CRLC here at our church, we have a kind of a fun relationship with her in that she um, often attended our church for worship on the Sundays that she did not have an assignment out to another congregation in our synod, even though she wasn't a member. She even came at Christmas Eve and played her flute during that and was a great support to us. In fact, a fun bit of trivia concerning her was that the very first Sunday after she was elected uh, as the bishop of the entire church, she worshiped in our congregation. Kind of a neat little fact of which perhaps I'm maybe a little bit too proud of, along with the fact that she was so gracious to come back and, and uh, baptized uh, uh, my son Theo uh, the first time she did any type of baptism since becoming the presiding bishop of the denomination. She was installed in the fall of 2013, and I like to talk uh, about her installation in the sense that when she was installed, myself and three other pastors watched her installation by streaming video, something we're doing a lot these days, but we watched it none other than the promised land of Galilee. We were staying in the Holy Land for a trip, and we were staying at a hotel in Galilee. We set out on the deck of this uh, hotel that overlooked uh, the Sea of Galilee and sat there, gathered around a computer screen to watch her be installed. Her first term ended uh, last year in 2019, and she was elected on the very first ballot to a second term the first bishop to ever have such support for a second term. So it's really kind of neat. She does a great job uh, leading our denomination. Now in our synod, uh, her successor, who became the bishop of Northeastern Ohio Synod, is Bishop Abraham Allende. Uh, the synod office for us is lo located in Cuyahoga Falls. The interesting thing about our synod right now and Bishop Allende was that it is a six-year term. He was elected in 2014, and his term ends this year on August 31st, 2020. And he had announced back in late winter that he would not, or I, bet, I guess it actually was late 2019, that he would not seek an additional term and would retire, meaning that the office of bishop for our synod would be open for election this spring. In fact, he was scheduled to have his farewell retirement reception here at our church. We were going to host it at the end of August. Well, guess what? This pandemic came along and has changed everything. Our process for electing a new bishop has been altered. The Senate Assembly in which that vote would take place has been postponed to maybe um, August 31st or likely beyond. And so our bishop, who was scheduled to take a little bit of a vacation, uh, has agreed to continue to serve until such a time in which we can elect his successor. So interesting time for him, and we certainly keep our prayers with him and his family uh, during all this as well. The synods, of course, then are not just one big ge geographical area, but they're also divided into conferences. We are part of the Cleveland West conference. I can remember thinking when I came here uh, that Brexville, why would we be meeting with uh, congregations to clean out in uh, uh, Lorraine and Medina and all that here in Brexville? I thought we'd be more attached to um, things on the east side, but then somebody explained to me, oh, it's the river. And I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. And so we are part of the Cleveland West conference. Our conference itself was then further divided into uh, clusters, and these clusters of pastors often meet together as uh, I do monthly with um, our number of local pastors, including Parma, Parma Heights, uh, Berea, 
uh, Broadview Heights and here and Brexville as well. Now the structure of our church uh, looks sort of like this. We have congregation synods. Again, regions do not have a lot of function any more. Um, they do serve some roles, but then the church-wide organization. So these three layer cake, if you will. I also wanted to talk about how as a denomination, we are a part, a member part of other Christian uh, organizations too. One of those is the Lutheran World Federation. Lutheran World Relief is another, the National Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches. In fact, some of our previous bishops have held offices in those great organizations. We are a member of Lutheran Social Services, which is a social agency on the ground that does frontline work in many synods, helping people. Um, we certainly have a powerful presence of Lutheran Social Services in our synod. And also Lutheran Disaster Relief, which helps uh, again when tornadoes and floods happen, as well as other organizations too. Now, this is one thing that does separate us from our Christian brothers and sisters of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Those two denominations, which are the next two biggest ones, um, choose not to be a part of any of these organizations. They believe that, uh, so to speak, their work is alone. They don't partner with each other as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in coming slides. But um, we are unique in terms that we are a part of these wider organizations, as I believe uh, we should be. So we are connected through um, ELCA World Hunger to over 60 countries around the world. We are a great contributor of helping to stomp out hunger they do an excellent ministry and have always been rated as one of the best because the amount of money we have and the amount that actually goes on the ground to help feed people. So we are a part of all these different aspects uh, of the world, working with brothers, other brothers and sisters in the Christian faith to help carry out the gospel of the good news. The ELCA also finds itself in a unique position in that we are in full communion with other denominations uh, in our country. And these include the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the United Church of Christ, the Methodist Church, the RCA, which is the Reformed Church in America, and the Moravian Church. What full communion means is that we recognize that we have such strong um, agreement about what the sacrament of Holy Communion means, that any differences are not church dividing. In other words, once these agreements have been made, I as a Lutheran pastor and an ELCA pastor could go in a Presbyterian church, an Episcopal church, and not only preach, but preside over communion. That's how strong we believe our agreements and viewpoints are concerning the sacrament of Holy Communion. The interesting thing is, is that some of these other denominations are not necessarily in full agreement with each other, but we are sort of the, uh, in the middle of the different spokes of the wheel, so to speak. And so the ELCA finds itself in this unique position of sort of being a pioneer and sort of bringing the wider church together around the sacrament of the altar. Our structure says a lot about us theologically as well. We are not uh, built in a way that a person has power from the top down over other people. Rather, ours is sort of very, if you will, democratic in its design. The highest governing body of the ELCA is the ELCA assembly when it meets. And those members that meet to vote on things come from representatives voted on from each synod who, rep who come to uh, represent the different areas, but also on their own conscience. They're, they're, they're very careful to use the word they're a voting member, not a delegate. In other words, they're not bound to a particular geographical area's opinion on things, but they come as faithful Christians to um, way out and discern what they think is best for the mission of the church and what God wants us to be about. We have a presiding bishop, as I mentioned before, and we have a church-wide council. 
and all those have governance, but they all answer to the churchwide assembly, which is held every three years. Our synod has the same structure. We have a bishop and we have a synod council. And the highest governing form of, the synod, of our synod is the synod assembly, which meets every year to make decisions. It's sort of a checks and balances. We send representatives each year to the Synod Assembly to vote on matters concerning our ministry here. And even our congregation is designed that way. Uh, the highest governing body of our congregation is you, the members of the church. We have an annual meeting or we have special meetings to decide other matters that are need special attention outside of what um, is in the Constitution uh, the authority given to the council, which in our case we call the vision board, along with the pastor. So the pastor does not decide policy, the council does not decide policy, um, but the church has the highest governing decision-making process. That doesn't mean, uh, I maybe state that better to say the pastor and the council certainly have authority to do certain things, but that's all under the umbrella of the congregation. And that is on purpose. Because we believe in this priesthood of all believers that as uh, a bishop, they are not more um, loved by God or specially appointed to be better than other people. So it's not a hierarchy, but a level playing field. A pastor is called to walk alongside, to journey with the people, which is the, what the word synod actually means, to walk along with, as we continue to live out this notion that it's a priesthood of all believers. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need some type of governance to handle matters, but pastors are called to serve the church, lead the church, but not meant to be all powerful. And we'll talk a little bit about this uh, in other sessions as, as well. Our called leadership of the church, you may wonder, how does that all come to be? Well, we have ordained pastors, and we have deacons. Deacons is sort of a new language for us, even though the deacon as a, uh, a, a the vocabulary in the church has had different forms over uh, history and certainly in other religious structures as well. But we have two basically rostered leaders of the church, the roster of uh, ordained to word and sacrament, and then uh, a roster of deacon ordained to word and service. Um, Deacons before that were in different uh, types of groups, diaconal ministers, deaconesses, and associates in ministry. And those were uh, different aspects. And so this decision to make them all deacons is a fairly recent one. And now we sort of have these two ways of being a leader in the church. So how do you become a leader in the church? It is really rather an involved process. You, there is the process of learning, of education, and then there's also the process of candidacy. That is, are you fit? Just because maybe you can pass some test and get a degree doesn't necessarily make you the best church leader, pastor, or deacon. And so you meet with a candidacy committee that guides you uh, through the process. Typically, for instance, a Lutheran pastor has a four-year undergraduate degree and then four years of seminary. Uh, a pastor who wants to be uh, go to seminary enters into a candidacy process. It's also the same with deacons. And the local congregation, uh, where that person is a member, determines which candidacy committee will they be with throughout their educational journey to becoming a servant of the church. And so, you meet not only to pass tests and grades, but you also meet with this committee that monitors how you are as a leader of the church. A pastoral candidate must have a Master of Divinity, which includes a clinical pastoral education called a CPE, means in like a type of hospital setting uh, or other type of institution that practices and hones hopefully their uh, pastoral skills as well as a type of internship, a field experience. If you get all this done, and speaking uh, as a pastor, what then happens is you then enter an assignment process, which is called the draft. 
and then in that draft, you are assigned to a region of the country and then a synod. And that then bishop of that synod that you're assigned to will then uh, begin the process of having you interview in congregations on their territory. While we as pastors or new leaders coming out of seminary and deacons can express a desire to serve in a certain area of the country and may have restrictions due to a spouse's occupation or an ailing parent or kids in school or uh, other things that might restrict, if those aren't in place that are very strong to a location, you can end up serving anywhere. And it often happens that some pastors, um, leaders, deacons of the church get assigned to an area which they never thought they would be. And um, that can be make for a little consternation for the f family and also the extended family when they may be moving to another side of the country. Each church leader uh, completes a profile for the bishop to help with the assignment process. And for a pastor, and I believe now for a deacon, you are not ordained in that role until you have a call from the congregation. So the congregation end of it is that, that uh, so does the bishop have power then to say, this, you are going to be the pastor of this congregation? Well, they may make recommendation. They do not have that power which is very different from what we may be used to hearing in our news around the practice of the Roman Catholic Church in which uh, the local bishop can say to this congregation, you're closed or um, you can't have services here anymore or this is your new priest, here you go. Uh, other church structures, the Methodists and others, there's very little input sometimes from the local congregation as to who will be their next church leader. In the ELCA, the congregation has a tremendous amount of power and are equal footing to the church leader, the congregation, and the bishop, if you will, tries to act as a matchmaker so that there is a good marriage, a good call between the pastor and the community of faith. And so if a pastor, uh, for instance, if there's a vacancy of a pastor in a certain congregation, the a call committee would be formed. They would interview potential candidates. Um, the congregation must do paperwork to fill out a file like what they are good at, what they think they need in the next leader, um, where are their weak areas, things about that make them unique. Um, and they would turn that into the synod. The synod itself would look at who they may have available and think this person might be good or no, this person might not be good. And again, they try to make that match well. Um, a call committee can ask for names of individuals who they, who they uh, may know want to be available for a call. The call committee then interviews pastors. They make a choice of who they think might be their best candidate. And that person becomes a primary candidate, which sort of means you're engaged if the pastor agrees to be the primary candidate. And that means then that that pastor and that congregation can't uh, talk about having another leader until the process is complete. Uh, during that time, the pastor meets with the call committee. They also meet with the church leadership. And then at the end, it's the congregation who votes uh, on the recommendation of church council and a call committee whether they want to extend a call to a church leader. And then the church leader, the pastor, the deacon themselves can say yes or no to that. And then if that all goes well, the bishop signs off and says, that's good. A few other things to put in here. Uh, the, where do we stand as an ELCA at Christ Redeemer Lutheran Church like in terms of our size? Well, if you look on this map, our average attendance, 150 to 200, puts us uh, in a group of congregations about of 804, which means that only 8.4% of other ELCA Lutheran congregations are bigger than us. Sometimes we may think of ourselves as a medium size to a small congregation, but the reality is we are bigger than over 90% of other ELCA congregations. That fact always surprises people, but that's true of many denominations in the United States. The smaller churches uh, far outnumber the largest churches, even though the largest churches have more people attend them, if that makes any sense to you. How is a bishop elected? 
it's by percentage, called an ecclesiastical ballot. On the first vote, any pastor in the Lutheran church, an ELCA pastor, can be put on a blank, it's a blank piece of paper, can be named. The election committee then makes sure that they are roster leaders in good standing, and that becomes the second ballot. Of that second ballot, if nobody gets 75%, then the top seven names go to a third vote. Of that ballot, two-thirds of those votes cast would need to be needed to elect that person as bishop. If that leader doesn't get, anyone doesn't get two-thirds of the vote, goes to a fourth ballot, of which it is now whittled down to the top three candidates, you would need 60%, and then finally a fifth ballot, of which uh, you would only need a simple majority of 50%, and that would only be between two candidates. Our ELCA has a youth gathering every three years. Right now, our next uh, ELCA youth gathering is scheduled for Minneapolis, Minnesota in the summer of 2021 uh, under the theme of Boundless. Let's hope that uh, things will be normalized, that that uh, youth gathering can take place. We give money to support our congregations called Mission Support. Here at our congregation, we pass 10% of our offerings on to the Synod. And then the Synod then gives approximately half of that income on to the wider church. So if you think of your weekly offering, 90% uh, of it stays here in our congregation for our practices. And then the 10% that we tie to onto our Synod uh, goes to help our synodical ministries across Northeastern Ohio. And then approximately half of that goes on to our church-wide organization, of which has ministries all over the world. So your money that you give here is touching people around the globe. It's an important part to remember because it's not just about our local congregation. And it steps in and does many different aspects of ministry. I wanted to basically conclude here talking a little bit more about the differences between a church's denominations that go by the word Lutheran because people often get these mixed up. And I don't want to start bashing another uh, denomination. That's not the purpose of this. But I did want to point out some differences because sometimes people miss the logo on the sign and they find themselves worshiping in another Lutheran church and they wonder why things are a little bit different and in some cases radically different. Again, I am very biased to the ELCA even though we are not perfect. And so I give you this viewpoint from the side of the fence that I stand on. I wish we, as a Lutheran church, got along better with our brothers and sisters who also call themselves Lutheran in terms of our theology and practice, but that is not always the case. Some of the biggest differences concern the role of women. The Missouri Synod and Wisconsin churches do not allow women to uh, serve as pastors. And not only that, many of the churches do not let them serve on governance, even in some cases not even allowed to uh, read lessons in church. And so that is a big difference in that. So if you go to a church that has a woman pastor, you are definitely not in a Wisconsin or Missouri Synod Lutheran church. There's also the uh, practice of open communion versus closed communion. Open communion, of which we practice here at Christ Redeemer Lutheran Church as part of the ELCA, means all Christians are invited to receive the sacraments of Holy Communion. We do not have to give permission to visitors who come. They are just welcome to come forward to receive it. That is not the case in the other Lutheran churches. And speaking about the uh, Missouri Synod, you must get permission from the pastor as a visitor in order to take communion. If you visit there, uh, the uh, elder of the church, somebody would approach a visitor and typically ask them if they are Missouri Synod. If not, um, they would either tell them not to take communion or maybe they say, do you want to talk to the pastor about possibly taking communion? And those decisions are then made according to the individual pastor's outlook on things. Some Missouri Synod pastors are very open to uh, having others take communion with them, but most follow the denomination line to say no. One of the stories that I tell uh, about the differences is that when I was on internship in Menasha, Wisconsin, 
There was an LCA and an ALC church that became the ELCA, and also two other churches in town, Wisconsin Synod and the Missouri Synod. And once a year, all four of these Lutheran churches got together with their confirmation students, and we called it Lutheran Night in our community. And the only way that the Wisconsin denomination would participate is if we agreed not to pray the entire time we were together. They, as long as well as the Missouri Synod, do not agree with praying with other Christians outside their denomination. I find this personally appalling, but even at the time of 9-11, when a leader of the Missouri Synod Church participated in a gathering near ground zero of Christian denominations praying for the aftermath of uh, the attacks, that Missouri Synod leader was disciplined by the denomination for participating in that prayer service because it's just not allowed. So even as I, as an ELCA pastor, uh, if I was on vacation and visited Missouri Synod and asked to take communion, most likely I would be told no. There are also some aspects of approach to scripture, um, literalist and more uh, inspired word of God, literal word of God, uh, we can talk about the liberal uh, conservative scale where these formed. I'm sure you can uh, make those deductions on your own. I, but it is often confusing because sometimes I will have people who um, visit these churches and come back and say, uh, I wasn't allowed to take communion. What, what's, what's going on there? And I have to look it up on the internet for them and say, well, see, it turns out that was not any LCA church. So again, we have our own problems too, but I'm very proud of the ministry that our denomination does and its outreach with other Christians working alongside of us and its presence in the world. That's why I am an ELCA pastor.